Hi, everybody, and welcome to Home Ice with David Quinn. I'm Michelle Jingris alongside Steve Valaket and Rangers head coach David Quinn. And a lot to get to today, guys, as we discuss the latest for the Rangers in phase two of the NHL's return to play plan. Also, centerman Ryan Strom will join us from Toronto later on in the show. And as always, Coach Quinn will answer your questions on Twitter. So, Coach, First up, as we advance through phase two, you're now allowed to have 12 players on the ice skating, but training camp still a couple weeks away and more and more players in multiple sports have been tested positive for COVID-19. So with all of those ups and downs, are you just approaching this situation with a cautious optimism? Take us through your, your day to day with all of this news every day. Yeah, you just, that's the way you have to go about it. You just, until you're told differently, you're preparing for a training camp to start on July 10th. Our guys are starting to filter back into New York right now, and everybody's going to go through the proper channels in order to get cleared to start practicing with, with the team and things like that. So, you know, obviously there have, there have been guys tested. I think uh, the players in the league in particular are going to see how, you know, this thing evolves uh, and how players react to the disease. But at the end of the day, you know, our job is to con continue to prepare for a training camp like we're going to play. And I, you know, I, I'm fully confident that that will happen. Some good news on those lines, along those lines, if everything is good to go and you guys are able to play, Rangers President John Davidson said Capo Caco, who suffers from type 1 diabetes, has been cleared to play. So great news for him as he looks to continue his development on this team. Yeah, it's good news for him and for us. It's uh, obviously you never want to put a player in harm's way and, you know, their health is first and foremost. And obviously, uh, you know, Capo has certainly continued to grow as the season went on. And he's, you know, I think he feels recharged too. You know, talking to him during this pandemic, you know, I sense a little bit more pep in his step, even though he's over in Finland. I just, you know, he's a little bit more engaging. I think he's getting more comfortable. And that's, you know, I think this might actually, in his mind, be the start of his second season, even though it's still the continuation of his first season. And, you know, I think he's relieved that he feels very good about coming back and playing. I think he feels safe. And that's going to be, that's probably the biggest thing uh, as we approach this uh, training camp. But, you know, I'm excited to have him come back. Quinny, uh, I'm going to let you inside the mind of a backup goalie. Is that all right? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Quinny, during practice, uh, us goalies, we're always concerned with what the coach thinks of us. And uh, what sometimes happens is I had to go through this in New York. I knew where everybody on the team was shooting. I knew that Ryan Callahan and Dubinsky were low blocker and Shanny was high glove. And it's not a good thing because then I get a start every couple of weeks and I'm tracking pucks for the first time. Um, I always had a rule where I didn't want to allow two goals in a row because I'm worried that Torts sees and then he's not going to play me, right? right. I'm wondering – Maybe what you're thinking when you see goalies letting goals. I mean, it's news that Shesterkin's back in town and the other two guys will be here shortly. But how do you evaluate your goalies? Just by looking at them or what do you think? Yeah, I think you pay attention. Obviously, with, when you're the head coach, there's a lot going on in practice. You're, you, know, you can't see everything. You're trying to see everything, but you can. It's just impossible. But you're certainly trying to pay attention to as much as you can. And obviously, goaltending is a big piece of it. And you know, you, a lot of it is, is dependent upon what drill is happening. Obviously, you want to put, keep your goalie sharp, but there's also, you know, you want the shots to be realistic. There's got to be a pace to it. There's got to be an urgency to the shooter, things of that nature. So I think there's a lot that goes into the evaluation of a goalie. I do – that's – we've touched on the, the cross-ice games. I, like, I love those for goalies. I think things happen fast. I think it's more realistic to what they're going to see in games. So, you know, I think there's a lot that goes into it, but you're certainly keeping an eye on the goalies for sure. All right, Coach, switching gears a little bit here. When looking back at this, on the season, as we've, we talked about on the show before, you guys had a lot of success against the Hurricanes this year. You swept them during the regular season. But against a team like the Philadelphia Flyers, for example, your team really seemed to struggle at certain points in the season against them. In situations like this, my question is, are you of the belief that it's not necessarily who you play, but when you play a team? There's a lot that goes into it, Michelle, for sure. And, you know, everybody talks about the fact that we're 4-0 against Carolina. And if you watch those games, we could have been 0-4. And if you watch the games against the Flyers, there's a lot that goes into that, too. Those games were – I don't want to completely uh, get into it, but those games were unique in their own way. And, and, and so, again, I mean, you know, a lot of that doesn't matter right now. Not only the fact that when you get into the playoffs, you can throw all the regular season stuff out the window – but on top of that, what we are going through, I think, adds a certain different twist to everything. So 
I don't think there's much relevance to what happened uh, in the first, you know, five months of the season to what we're going to see moving forward here. Quinny, I have a former pro hockey player in my neighborhood uh, named Paul Kelly, and he told me a story about when he played for Tommy McVie. Tommy sits him down and says, you've got a lot of potential, but you know what that means, Paul? You haven't done it yet. And uh, that's his first meeting with the coach as he turns pro. And I'm wondering if knowing the team this year, a lot of potential before the season began, was there one point in the season period or after a game where you maybe lean back and like, yeah, we're pretty good. It was, can one game stand out for you? You know, there were plenty of times early on, even though we were winning and losing, that I thought we were good, but we were having trouble with consistency. You know, maybe the game that jumps out at me uh, when you talk about early on, is the 4-1 win against Tampa Bay at home after we got yeah. shellacked by the Bruins two nights before that. And I loved how we reacted, you know, to losing to the Bruins. And now you're facing Tampa Bay, you know, a perennial Stanley Cup favorite. And it said an awful lot about our group. I think, you know, as – and I mentioned this before, as you're evaluating your team, you're trying to find out what type of characteristics they do have. Do they have some resiliency? Are they mentally tough? Can they rebound from a bad night? And, you know, not only did we rebound, we played very well and we defended well. I think we only gave up 12 scoring chances that night. So I knew, you know, from that, I knew that we had it in us. The, the, the goal was to be able to do it consistently. And, you know, and then I think about the game in Vancouver after we lost to Calgary uh, out west 4-3. We lost two nights later uh, to Vancouver 2-1. to one, But, boy, we played really well. And sometimes winning and losing can fool you. You know, you can win a game and – if you dig deep, you could say to yourself, uh-oh, we can't do that anymore. And you could lose a game and think, we, got, we, we found something. And I think that Vancouver game, we all thought to ourselves, okay, this is what we need to do more, more consistently. And I thought from that point on, I think after that point on, I actually watching our game against Montreal, and we came back and beat them 5-2, to two, second time we were in Montreal. I think up to that point, we had the most wins in the NHL from January 7th to, I think, February 22nd. We were the number one scoring team in the league. We are the fifth best defensive team in the league. We had the best power play. So we found that six, seven-week stretch where, you know, we, we had that consistency. Speaking of that six, seven-week stretch, uh, Let's look back on a defining moment that was that obviously stands out to us. February 19th, Rangers had just come off to a loss to the Bruins, kind of similarly to when they came off to that loss earlier in the season. And then you're in Chicago. You're trying to get back in the playoff race. It's tied one-to-one -one after two periods. I don't know what you said in that second <laughs> intermission or what those players ate or what it was, uh, but the Rangers came out. They scored five goals in the third period, and that – sparked a five game winning streak. So what clicked in that second intermission that just let you guys roll like that uh, for, for a few games following as well? Well, I, you know, first of all, we always had that ability, right? If you look at, at, you know, we had the ability to score goals, but what jumps out of me in that game is that after the second period, you know, our two of our lines were going. The two lines that were God awful those first two periods was Abanage Jad and Strom's line. And I never do this, but for some reason I did. I just went in and challenged both those lines. I said, if I can get you two lines to play like the other two lines, we're going to win this game. Where the bleep have you been for 40 minutes? And, you know, I think it kind of pissed them off. And, you know, but again, I don't want, I mean, I, I don't know if that's the reason it happened, but, you know, my point is we always had that in us to be able to erupt for goals. And I've said this before, we have the ability to do things teams can't do. We can score goals. It's hard to do in this league we got to continue to be good at the things everybody can do. But the thing that jumped out at me is that as a staff, I remember sitting in the coach's room like, you know, these two lines have been god awful. And, you know, we talked like time to challenge them. And I had never done that before. So it felt pretty good. Great stuff. When we come back, we're headed to the Rangers film room to highlight the play of Yes for Fast. That's all coming up when Home Ice with David Quinn returns. Welcome back to Home Ice with David Quinn. I'm Michelle Jingris, and it seems pretty clear already just how valuable Jesper Fast is to the Rangers. In fact, he's won the Players' Player Award the last four seasons. Now, that award is given to the players who best exemplify what it means to be a team player. For more on that, Coach Quinn takes us inside the Rangers' film room, orchestrated by Lenovo and CDW, people who get it. As a coach, uh, trust factor with a player is very important. And, you know, we don't trust anyone more than we do Jesper Fast. And you're going to see some of the things he does that maybe you don't see with the naked eye. And he's incredibly valuable on the penalty kill. You see here, I love the fact how quick he's 
getting after the puck. He's moving as the puck's going, stopping and starting, getting back into position. As a group, we're doing a really good job getting after Vancouver here, keeping everything on the perimeter. As that pass is made to, to Pedersen, Fast does a great job sniffing out one of the best players in the league. Stays on it, stays on top of Vancouver, gets back to the middle of the rink. He's got great stick positioning here. You know, you can sense Vancouver getting a little bit frustrated. Gets back to the middle where he should be. And again, a very harmless sequence by Vancouver and Fast has a huge role in that. Again, penalty kill situation. He gets up ice. One on five here. You see one Ranger and five Islanders, and there's Jesper Fast doing what he does best, working hard, keeping the play alive in the offensive zone, killing valuable time in a 1-1 hockey game, and that makes a smart change. So those things, again, so important on our penalty kill. Uh, he's a guy that we lean on heavily. In the offensive zone, play goes from side to side. He skates in small areas, wins a puck battle, gets back to the net front, uses the back of the net to keep the play alive in the offensive zone towards the end of the second period, allows us to establish some valuable zone time. The thing I love about him is he's always in the right position, right? A deep pinch, he's F3, and we keep the puck alive. Again, I mean, people talk about what he does for us defensively, but he does a great job offensively for us as well. And again, initial rush. His skates up ice, makes a great reception here and gets rid of that puck so quickly. Gives us a three-goal cushion at a pivotal time in a 5-3 hockey game. Again, our D-zone coverage against Philly. We do a good job causing a turnover. He flies the zone. Watch that reception. That's a heck of a pickup by Fast. He shoots it. He stays with it and buries it in the net. Deflects to Panarin. Has a long pass. A beauty to Fast. He shoots. And a safe. It's put in. Yes, for Fast! What a play! Back now with Steve Valiquette and David Quinn. And Coach, as you just showcased Jesper's game in full bloom, and we now get to welcome one of his line mates and new father, Ryan Strom, to the show. Joining us from Toronto, Ryan, thanks so much for taking the time today. Yeah, thanks for uh, having me on here. So you literally just got off the ice in Toronto. Uh, we're curious, just how have you been adapting to this obviously this crazy time and just trying to stay in shape. I know you mentioned your slide board that coach sent you is just over there on the side of the room as well. So what have you been doing? Um, I've been uh, able to do a lot of workouts, which is nice. I have a little gym here at the house and uh, uh, a nice big backyard space to do some, uh, you know, some movement activities and stuff, which is nice. And um, recently in Toronto, the rinks have opened up too. and I got my equipment now. So I've been able to get back on the ice and kind of get back into the swing of things. So, um, it kind of feels like summer training, to be honest with you. It feels like it's kind of like August ramping up for training camp type thing. But uh, uh, I'm pretty lucky that I've been able to have, uh, you know, my trainers close by and I have my brothers that I can train with. So we've been able to kind of keep it competitive and uh, stay in pretty good shape, to be honest with you. So I feel pretty good and um, I feel like I'm ready to play. So I've, uh, I, there's not much more I can ask for. So, Quinny, I was on the coaching staff in Bridgeport when Stromer joined us coming from Niagara Falls in the OHL. Uh, he's a big personality. Young guy came in. He was already on the stereo, telling jokes, running the room. And uh, just let us know what it's like to have him in the locker room and how important it is to have a guy with uh, those intangibles just help everybody, especially the young guys. Yeah, well, obviously our sport is a game of emotion and personalities are a big part of it. And you can't have all same personalities in the locker room. And, you know, one of the things that Ryan brings to the table on top of what you see on the ice is he's a great personality off the rink. Guys got drawn to him. You know, he's, uh, you know, it's a long season and there are some dark days and the long days. And, you know, during those times, you need people like Ryan with that great personality. And, you know, whether he's telling a joke or making fun of somebody, uh, you know, certainly it makes for a potential long day into a little bit of a shorter day. And it certainly allows people to want to come to the rink a little bit more. So, you know, on top of what you see, what he brings on the ice is certainly an element to his game away from the rink that's very valuable. And uh, Stromer, you know, it was interesting just following your career the last seven years where you came in, top scoring guy, played that role right away with the Islanders. And then fast forward five years, I'm just wondering if you added or consciously thought about becoming a fighter for a little while, killing penalties, uh, checking as a centerman has to at points, just to elevate yourself back in the lineup into a scoring role. I've seen a lot of hockey players not willing to add those elements to their game and then just be out of the league. You. How did you do it? Um, well, I wouldn't say fighters necessarily on the resume. Let's just get that out of the way real quickly. I'm <laughs> fighting. We do not <laughs> want him fighting. Pretty nice yeah. <laughs> But uh, I've had a few. But, no, I honestly just think it's a matter of, uh, 
just earning the coach's trust. I think, uh, you know, when I was in Edmonton, I had McDavid and dry settle. So obviously I'm not going to be a scoring centerman there. So you kind of have to adjust. And um, when I got the opportunity to begin pen penalty killing and uh, take some more face offs, I think it's just a matter of trying to find ice time. I think, you know, it probably took me a little bit longer than I wanted to, to figure out that I kind of had to, you know, find those other elements. But um, I think just to, to have the coach's trust, especially what I have in New York now, I think, uh, you're viewed in a different light as you get a little bit older. Um, you've been through the ups and downs. I think you're, you're able to play on the penalty kill. You're able to play, you know, up and down the lineup. I know, I mean, it was only last year where I was playing on the fourth line in New York for a little bit. So, um, you know, you got to be able to kind of play all those roles. And um, it's not easy. You know, it definitely, you know, kind of sucks at time as a player. You want to be the guy. But um, at the end of the day, it's about helping the team. And I think if the coach and the GM and um, the staff knows that you're willing to do what it takes to kind of help the team win and you, you have that personality that um, you just, that's just part of growing your resume and growing your toolbox and um, that was something that my dad harped on just trying to find those minutes and something I was able to you know fortunately be, be able to do. You mentioned a couple of things there that I just want to touch on quickly. How important is that adaptability? I mean I know you said you've been skating in Toronto and it's kind of like summer skating ramping up before you head back to a training camp to start a season. However, you're not really starting a season. You're, you're really hitting the ground running where games are really important. So how are you going to be able to make that switch mentally? And are you already kind of starting to, to try to get in that mindset? Um, to be honest, it's a great point. I think it's, it's kind of impossible, really. I, I mean, it's impossible to emulate a summer workout knowing that you're going to have a chance to be in the playoffs if you, you, have, you win your play-in games, right? So it's a very, very unique situation. But I think that's what training camp will be good for, I think. Um, we have a team group chat and guys are really, uh, really energetic, really enthusiastic and I'm um, really excited for our opportunity. I think, you know, sometimes when we talk about this whole pandemic and the stuff going on, I don't think people realize how hard it is to play in the playoffs. I haven't played in the playoffs, in, I think four seasons. So uh, we have a great opportunity here. So I think that once we all get back together in New York, we get training camp going. I think that's when things will really ramp up and um, the competitive spirits will be flowing. But um, I think for e each individual guy, I think the way I'm kind of treating it, it's just, do as much as you can to get ready physically. Um, the mental aspect and the team aspect will come in training camp. And um, I think once you see everyone together in training camp, McQueenie blowing his whistle uh, as loud as he possibly can, that'll put guys uh, right in the perfect frame of mind. We'll get to the Quinnyisms a little bit later. Um, one thing we like to do on the show is we like to highlight memorable moments from the season up until the stoppage point. And one of those most memorable moments was the mom's trip, in particular, your mom reading out the lineup uh, before the game. What was that experience like for you? I know moms and dads, but moms especially, a lot of players talk about how uh, how much of a role they play in helping them with their game and driving them to practice growing up and stuff. So, so what was that moment like for you? Yeah, uh, Cooney really, uh, eight, I think I aged five years sitting there when she was reading the lineup, I think. I've said this before, like when you see your two worlds clashing, your mom who's been there your whole life making you meals and, you know, kind of a mama's boy type thing. And then you're in your hockey atmosphere, you're kind of a guy's guy. And then your mom's in the middle of it, reading a lineup, giving you a kiss and a hug. You're kind of like, it's just too much to handle. But uh, honestly, I think uh, aside from my personal, not, not embarrassment, but my anxiety aside, I think, um, for my mom to be able to have that experience and for the Rangers to be able to do what they do for the parents. I mean, like every single thing that the, they do on the mom's trip and the dad's trip is first class and second to none. And um, I know all of that is just a great memory in itself, but for her to be able to read the lineup, I think, you know, that's something that she tells everyone. I think it's a conversation starter for her friends and um, for, for parents, it's a little bit of a, not unrewarding because they're seeing their kids live their dream, but they're just kind of in the background. So when she got to have a little bit of her moment, I think, you know, really meant a lot for her. I know what she's done to get us to this point. And um, I remember her going back to work just so we could play minor hockey because it was so expensive. So just little things like that come to my mind when I see her get to do that. And um, it, it's certainly a moment she'll never forget. And, um, you know, a special moment that I, I think very few, if any, players can ever say they've got to experience. Strober, I just wanted to ask you about playing with Panarin. Is he the kind of guy when you get off the ice and you're on the bench, is he all over you, challenging you? Is he a guy that wants to talk about every detail about the shift or is he just chill? Um, he's honestly pretty positive. I think uh, um, surprisingly enough for how skilled he is and how, uh, how creative he is on the ice. Like when things aren't going well, he often gets back to the basics. He'll sometimes say like in broken English, you know, guys, let's just chip it in or let's get it deeper. You know, let's just play in the offensive zone. So, um, you know, he's probably a little more simple when things are going well, but I think when things are going well, he's always trying to, 
you know, find more plays. He kind of tells you what you're thinking or what he sees out there. And um, just a special talent. I mean, he's challenged me so much. I think he's made me so much better. Uh, probably more so in practice, just being ready every practice. Like he, he's out there, he's ready to snap it around and make plays and he wants you to be ready. He, if you miss a pass, he's going like, he puts his arms up at you. If your, if your saucer pass isn't flat, he's kind of letting you know. So um, I think that's his way of kind of challenging his line mates and his teammates. And during the game, he's pretty positive. He wants to win. He's very competitive, but uh, you know, he's a, he's a great teammate. I think Quinny would agree that, uh, you know, his energy and his, uh, I guess his enthusiasm kind of rubs up on everyone. And, when you see a guy with his amount of talent kind of, you know, battling for pucks and doing what he does, I think it, uh, you know, is uh, contagious throughout the lineup. And he's, uh, he's certainly a very special player. And obviously he's been great for me, but I think so many guys in our team, I think have grown so much from a guy like him, just having him around every day. Absolutely. And uh, last one from me, Stromer. Uh, we've gotten the opportunity here to meet uh, Quinny for several weeks in a row. And we think we know almost everything we need to know about him at this point. But what can you share with us that we don't know about David Quinn? Well, I'm not going to embarrass him too much. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, after he brought my mom in the dressing room and all that stuff. But um, I think in just a little bit of uh, not, not off topic, but I think something you might not see every day is just I think Quinny is very understanding as a coach. And I think, you know, it's really refreshing when you go into a video room and um, you're not getting beaten down every day. I think there was a lot of times this year when you probably could have had a pretty ugly video, but he goes, you know, there's 82 games and you're not going to bring it every night. You're not going to have it every night and um, you're not going to feel great every day. And that's just the part of pro hockey. And I think it's that understanding when the coaching staff is able to do that, or if they're, for example, even when I have a bad game and they're able to call you in and just have a conversation with you rather than not talk to you at all. I think it's just those little things that go a long way within an individual and in the team aspect. And, um, you know, it's like I said, something as simple as just not giving you, you know, too much, uh, too much grief for a bad game and just kind of rush, brushing it off and getting back to work. And I think some coaches can get caught up in the day to day, but I think when a coach is able to be a little more personal and have that side of it, I think it, uh, like I said, it goes a long way and it makes coming to the rink that much more enjoyable. Drama, real quick on a personal note for you, as we mentioned, you're a new father. So some silver lining in this whole thing. You've gotten to spend a lot of time with your new little baby. How was your first Father's Day? And are you just completely smitten? Yeah, it's, uh, it's been crazy. The first five weeks have been nuts. I think uh, getting back to a normal sleep schedule has been kind of nice the last few weeks. But uh, it's just the greatest feeling in the world to be a father, I think. Um, you know, just the little things, just to see her. She's only five weeks, but starting to smile and starting to react a little bit. And um, just, just so amazing to see you know, your own little child. And I know how much my parents did for me as a kid. And uh, I just hope I can be the half the parents they were. So um, yeah, it's been a silver lining in this whole quarantine. I, I wish the baby was born maybe about 12 weeks ago. So I had something to do for the first eight weeks of quarantine. <laughs> but uh, you know, all in all, it's been, uh, it's been a great experience. And um, it's also been really nice for me just to be able to, you know, with all the training and the skating ramping up to have a little bit of an outlet and come home and be able to just to play dad for a little while. And um, enjoy that side of life too has been uh, you know amazing for me to learn and um, it's a challenge and it's it's difficult but it's uh, also one of the most rewarding things so far in life. Absolutely well congratulations again to both you and your wife and thank you so much for joining the show today. Yeah thanks so much thanks for having me on. Thanks, Joe. When we come back we are headed to Twitter to get your questions answered by Coach Quinn that's all when Home Ice with David Quinn returns. Welcome back to Home Ice with David Quinn. It's time now to head to Twitter and get your questions answered. So let's kick things off with at Forever Blue Shirts, who wants to know, going into your first NHL playoff series, who do you go to for advice to help you prepare for a new experience? Obviously, it's nice to be part of this organization because a lot of people within this organization have played a lot of playoff games and have been involved in a lot of playoff games. So, you know, obviously, Lindy Ruff is coaching off a lot of NHL playoff games and has a lot of success and you know Chris Drury played in a lot of games and we got players on a team that have played in a lot of games but I think the key for us is going to be just continue to approach it the way we normally do and I think the overall instinctive intensity will be lifted just because it is playoff hockey but I think you got to be careful and not changing too many things or approaching it too differently uh, when playoffs start especially with a young team I think they've got to understand that it's just hockey you just got to get out there and do the things we're doing Probably going to do a little bit harder and a little bit faster. All right, Quinny. Uh, mine is from at Jess Malika, and she asks, or I shouldn't uh, even say she, I don't know these names. Uh, who knows? 
what have you done during this pause that couldn't have uh, that you couldn't have in a normal life, and how has that helped you grow as a coach? You know, I've spent a lot of time probably looking at other teams more than I normally have. Um, you know, with all this time, and you know, I, I'm always a big believer in just coach your team. I mean, just you know, if you can make every player incrementally better as the season goes on, regardless of your systems, you're going to have a good hockey team. And that's kind of been my approach forever since I, regardless of the level that I've coached at. And, you know, but I think I've taken a little bit more time looking at other teams and seeing some of the things that they do. Not that I don't do that anyway, but probably more so than I would if I didn't have all this time. All right. Well, that will do it for us this week on Home Ice with David Quinn. Thanks everyone so much for submitting your questions and we'll see you right here again next week.